Okay, we're back. We're live for the one o'clock show here on a given Tuesday uh, with John David and a history professor at HPU. Today, we're going to talk about business cycles and the history of business cycles in this country and beyond this country. You know, and uh, so we're probably good. We are having a significant business cycle. It yeah. could get much worse. We should study these business cycles, right. recessions, depressions, in order to get a handle on where we are and what we need to have to get out of it again. Right. So, John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Jay. Good to be on. So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, well, we live in interesting times, huh? Yes, I mean, we do. Uh, yeah. Unemployment yes. of almost 40% in Hawaii, almost 20% nationally. Wow, this is uh, it's un unheard of, unthought of. I mean, this is Great, great Depression stuff. You know, you, know, you know what, though, John? Yeah. People have, and it's all about people. It's all about confidence and you know, in the economy and the government and all that, people have this strange notion that, that, that they can go right back. We can just go right back. We can return to the way it was yeah. and the, the, the machine will tick along just the way it was ticking along before. Right, so and can, since we've only, we're only out of it by a couple of months now, right. uh, if that, you know, there's, there's a certain credibility to that thought. Well, but, you look at I, don't, I don't market. feel it's necessarily something to rely on. Well, you look at the stock market and the stock market, of course, went down pretty dramatically. But then it had, uh, you know, in April, it had the best month, I think, since the Great Depression, actually. And so it recovered at least partially. And uh, I think this is crazy making, honestly. I mean, you know, you, you look at these unemployment numbers, we're going to look at, uh, you know, uh, a, a GDP that has a drop of, I, mean, I don't know, 15, 20 percent, uh, maybe even more. It could be as high as 37 percent. So, so the stock market by rights should not be going up at this time. But I think this is some of the same kind of thinking that this is going to be short term. We'll just go back to normal. Everything will be fine. And, and you know, the stock market is the worst place to get long term wisdom. Okay, it's it's the place for short term thinking and for the herd, what I would call what many call the herd mentality. Uh, and so, yeah, it's definitely a problem. But, uh, Jay, before we go further, I just wanted to talk to the, to the audience about a few of the books. You know, we've been talking about uh, epidemics. I wanted to talk about a few of the books that are really good that you should look at if you want to study the history of epidemics. Uh, just to interject this. And so. Uh, the first book is a book by William McNeil, which was published in the 1970s, and he's kind of the grandfather of the history of epidemics. It's a great book by a great world historian. Uh, and then you have a slew of books published after that. Around the turn of the century, you have, you have The Great Influenza by John Berry, which is an award-winning book on, on the Spanish flu. And then you have uh, the Justinian's Flea, which is a great book about uh, the plague and, you know, in, in the... Uh, uh, in the Byzantine Empire, and then you have another book about the Spanish flu by Alfred Crosby, who is a highly recognized uh, uh, world historian as well. Uh, and then so you get this, you have, a, you have actually a full bookshelf of books about this, especially about the Spanish flu. You have another book by Laura Spinney recently that has internationalized the Spanish flu, so it's studied, you know, the Spanish flu in other parts of the world. So so you have these, these great books, and then you also have this book uh, that I was, we were just talking about. This is a book called This Time It's Different by Carmen Reinhardt and, and Kenneth Rogoff. And this is, to bring us back to the subject today, this is, this is not about pandemics, but this is about economic crises, specifically about debt and inflation. And this book can help us to kind of sort through the historical implications of what it means today to be in the situation that we're in. Yeah, we just can you hold up for a minute? I just got to call my broker. <laughs> well, Jay. <laughs> okay, if you're in the stock market, let's push pause. I think, I think we all got to call our brokers. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, everybody's, I mean, there's a lot of people who are still in the stock market. Everybody's saying, you know, cost average and don't worry about it, stay in. And I read a very good article by a, you know, a wizened old stockbroker, and he said, look, th this time is, is different. And we really need to look at this, and we really need to reassess 
if you have money in stocks right now, boy, I would reassess because uh, there's a lot of, of magical thinking about what's going to happen with this recovery. Um, the, the Federal Reserve says, you know, 2021, maybe midway through 2021, we'll start to see a recovery. Um, you can't put, you know, hundreds of millions of people back to work in a month or a couple of weeks. It's just not going to happen like that. Businesses have been destroyed in this crisis. So it's just not, you know, anyway, I hope you're okay, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. But you know, there's a mechanical issue there. I mean, even if the businesses, to take it in a sequence, even if the businesses had not been destroyed, there's right. a tremendous lo logistical problem about putting people back again. Right. Which ones? They all come back and, and stand in the same place. And what right. do you do about, you know, since we really haven't solved the COVID problem, uh, what do you do about the risk of COVID? I mean, uh, you know, right. if, if they tell me I have to go back and just really interesting stuff going on. Yeah. They tell me I have to go back and, and work in the, um, you know, the food processing plant, one right. of those various plants that are collapsing yeah. because of COVID. Right, right. Um, and I say, wait a minute, that's dangerous over there. Yeah. Um, this is one of the high, you know, the highest incident of COVID in the country. You want me to go back and work and you haven't done anything to make it safer? I'm yeah. not going to do it. Now there was one. There was one governor, and maybe there's more than that, who said, "You got to go back to work, or we aren't going to pay your unemployment insurance anymore." Oh yeah. And, and arguably, you know, Trump may his name be erased. Um, you know, he is he is also on that team. He wants yeah. people to go back and work in dangerous right. situations just to build his economy. And, right. And so, I, I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, uh, it's it's a struggle because of the tremendous volume of the unemployed. Uh, you know, just in a, if you look at it in a general picture in Hawaii here, I mean, we have so many unemployed that the the state unemployment system can't deal with it. We're talking maybe a third of all, more than a third of all workers are unemployed, and and maybe half of those workers haven't gotten access to un unemployment benefits yet. So this. This two trillion dollar uh, bill that the Congress passed and the president signed has been a bit of a kind of an empty promise in some ways, because uh, because of the quite frankly the antiquated uh, unemployment uh, software that this state uses and the lack of uh, resourcing. You know, we're we're used to unemployment about two to three percent. You know, uh, we've we've never in this in this state in Hawaii we've We've had lots of underemployment, but we've had very little unemployment. And so, and we've never really dealt with the underemployment. And now we're having to deal with both that and the unemployment and this huge backlog. And I was just, I was talking with my wife this morning who had read an article and, you know, there are people who are, they're spending down their savings and they still haven't gotten their unemployment checks from the state and they're very scared about the future. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a lot worse than it looks if you're watching the stock market, I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, so that's, and the big question, which is uh, really important for us to understand historically is you reach a certain point and there's no there there. The government has no money to help you. Right. You have no money yourself. Okay. Um, there's no jobs. There's no immediate future, maybe a long-term future, but no immediate future. What happens to society? And we don't know. We don't know how the unravel takes place. But yeah. it, it will be instructive to look at earlier business cycles, right. other economic failure periods, yeah. and learn from them. So what, what do we learn? Right. So if we look at the, the Spanish flu, for instance, there, there were two recessions there was one recession in late 1918 that was short-lived. We think it was pretty deep, although there's not a lot. There's not a lot of economic data from that time period, uh, but but seven months, um, and and then there was a recovery. But then uh, then in 1919, a year later, then there was another much deeper recession, which coincided with the end of World War II, and it and it coincided with the demobilization of troops and the the demobilization of, of American manufacturing. And so uh, this is kind of, it's been confusing because of the timing of these recessions. 
it's always looked like, look, these are primarily because of the end of the war, not because of the, uh, the Spanish flu. We just don't know in that situation. There was, however, significant unrest in the summer of 1919, which did coincide with uh, another outbreak of the Spanish flu. And it coincided with the second more serious recession. It was just coming on right at the end of that summer of, of unrest. So you had the race riots in all of the major cities, Detroit, Chicago, Wilmington, Atlanta. You had, uh, you, had uh, you know, bomb threats at the Capitol. You had an actual bomb that was put at the door of the, the Attorney, General, uh, uh, Attorney General Palmer. Uh, you had a general strike taking place in late, late 1918 in Seattle uh, and other, all kinds of labor. I mean, the labor unrest was unbelievable. What, what were they saying? Were the people who were protesting, striking, uh, putting bombs on doorsteps? What, what were they saying? What was their concern? What were they expressing? Well, par partly they were nervous about the fact that there was a lot of unemployment and uh, they were scared about the economy. And then they were, they were, you know, one of the things that was happening because it was the end of the war is that the government was setting wages and setting wage increases and, and uh, workers didn't have control over this. Uh, they were very concerned that they were the ones, you know, that the capital would keep the money and they were the ones who would get screwed in this. So, uh, so there, was a, there was a great deal of unrest. And of course, you, you know, Woodrow Wilson is sick in the White House. He's had a stroke. So he can't provide the leadership that you need uh, to calm things down. And that might be similar to the present day in, in a in sort of way. Uh, so you have a situation where that, that's very serious in 1919. And we just have never, historians have never connected it that strongly to the Spanish flu. But that had to be a factor. I mean, mm -hmm. fear about getting the flu fear about, you know, the flu coming back again, because of course the Spanish flu came back uh, th three times, two times, you know, it came back in, in fall uh, 1918, and then it came back again in 1919. And uh, it came back in a more virulent form. And that's one of the fears about the, the coronavirus is that it will come back next fall in a more virulent form. And then we will wish for spring 2020 because it, it uh, Let's hope that doesn't happen. That's that's well. Great. If we if we go into um, you know trying to open all open the economy too early, uh, it could come back sooner yeah. than next fall. I, it could I, come I, back I, in a matter of weeks. Yeah, I mean, I'm not against opening up the economy. I think that uh, you know the protocols are very important. Wearing a mask. If everybody wears masks, hey, in in Kailua where I live, everybody's wearing a mask now. And this was like this started. Uh, you know, in, in early April, it was like maybe 10% of people were wearing, wearing masks, and then 50%, and then it became the law, and then people got on board, and now everybody's wearing masks, and there's, there's hand sanitizer at the, in front of all the stores. And so if, if, if we can take those kind of precautions, I'm, honestly, I'm not too worried because we can knock this down. The thing is, in the Spanish flu, the healthcare providers wore masks. But the average American did not wear a mask and, and should have. I mean, that should have been the recommendation. That, that's probably one of the differences is the, the health, uh, the, the public health protocols are better now than they were during the Spanish flu. I think, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the, magic, um, the magic step would be to have testing. We've heard this before, yeah. but we still don't have testing at will, testing really quick, testing 15 minutes. Yeah, I, um, Patrick Sullivan of Ocean, it was just on the show last hour, yeah. talking about trying to develop a test where you, you spit in a, in a coffee cup and it yeah. immediately tells you if you have COVID. Right, and, right. and that would be very helpful in yeah. managing, managing the illness, even if we were back at work and it would well, give us a way, a way to protect ourselves back at work. And, um, and I, th I think also the antibody test, I mean, I think I'm going to go get the antibody test. Because I think I might have had COVID and just was a mild case, uh, but I don't know, and I'd like to know. Would, so, would you step back from the camera just a few inches, John? Yeah, sure, Jay. Right. <laughs> oh, you're worried. Jay. Don't don't breathe <laughs> on the computer. Right, right. I got it. Don't worry. I don't think this is transmitted 
via, you know, via the internet. So I think they're, they're all <laughs> okay, kinds of other- so, so we, we had, we had uh, you, this book you were talking about, the one that's right. hard to read, the last one you referred to, <laughs> yeah. um, that, that time, talks yeah. about what happened in Germany, right? Uh, with, right so, uh, after the war and in the 20s. Right. Now, this, uh, and, this, and that yeah. is something we should know about. Yeah. Okay, so, so when we look forward to what, what could happen with the American economy, I mean, we could have a, you know, a, a standard recovery in, in 12 to 18 months. You know, it could, it, we could come out of this no problem. There's some problems though. And, and so, and let me talk about the problems first and then we can go back into the history and look at some examples. And essentially it's either Japan or Germany in different time periods in the 20th century. And so uh, one of the things, one of the problems we have right now is we have tremendous debt worldwide. The global debt situation is unprecedented. And I have a slide here about derivative debt. And derivative debt is about uh, 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 credit default swaps and, and the collateralized debt obligation. It's about, it's about taking debt and selling that debt off. And you can see there we have $516 trillion worth of derivative debt right now. And the world GDP is only about, it's a little more than 50, it might be 60 uh, trillion or 70 trillion dollars now. And, and we have this enormous amount of derivative debt. And uh, so, and it's, it's more than the stock market. Uh, so I, th I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, this is unprecedented time. So, so we have the debt overload. The United States has a national debt of over 20, 20 trillion dollars now. Well, more than half of all of our GDP goes to pay the debt. Uh, it's over a hundred percent of our uh, of our uh, GDP. Um, uh, so, more than hundred percent of our income, our national income, goes to to pay. You know, the national bu budget. Pardon me, goes to pay the debt. So, so. Our debt has really increased, and in that situation, uh, there, there are two outcomes that could take place. Uh, that one of the outcomes is we could have uh, the beginnings of inflation ratcheting up. This is what happened to Germany in World War I. Okay, Germany had to increase the amount of its money supply by 400%. Hmm. Uh, that it, means was that similar to what we're doing right now at the Fed? Well, we are increasing the money supply. I don't think it's by that much uh, right now, but yeah, the Fed is actually creating electronic money every day, uh, different kinds of ways, sending credit out to, uh, to businesses, sending credit out to other nations, buying, uh, buying uh, uh, treasury bonds. So the, the Fed is actually doing this, but not at the same level as Germany. Now, and there's some other differences. So. So but that's never without conse consequences down the road, right? Right, right. No, that's right. It's, it's definitely got consequences. But, but here's the interesting thing. So when you, when you increase the money supply that much, at least in that time period, and you're, you, these are, this is a period of basically national economies, there's not a lot of investment, uh, international investment in other people's currencies, this kind of thing, uh, then uh, what you can expect is you're going to reduce the value of your currency dramatically. And this is what happens in Germany when they printed money, printed money for the war, and then they reduce the value of their own currency. And then, and then it becomes this untenable cycle where you, you continue to print more money to pay for the things that become more and more expensive because you have less value in your currency. The currency was the Reichsmark. And so by 1923, uh, billions of Reichsmarks, okay, were spent for a week's wages. Uh, Reichsmarks were basically worthless. People were throwing Reichsmark. Yeah, there's, there's a picture of children playing with Reichsmarks, building blocks with Reichsmarks. Another picture of a woman burning Reichsmarks to keep warm. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you have, Kites made out of Reichsmarks, and you have, uh, you know, you have uh, big stacks of Reichsmarks that are used to, to pay people to make purchases. Uh, so, you know, you had to use a wheelbarrow to go get a loaf of bread. Well, at the end of the day, you couldn't buy a loaf of bread for, you know, any reasonable price. And um, so you couldn't have a loaf of bread and people would go hungry. And right. that affects the social fabric. And 
Uh, let me yeah. let me ask a question to you on that point yeah, that came in while you were speaking just right, now. Right, I see that. Yeah. Um, the, the the questioner says, "Good point about protest and violence. What challenges do you think our local union shops will be dealing with?" On the show last week with Eric Gill from Local Five, uh, that's the hotel workers. Right. He said the trust fund is paying for benefits for their members and the employers are not making their contributions. Yeah, okay, this is very serious. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, can can be very dangerous in the long term or maybe even in the short term. But uh, so, so you have Germany in that situation. Let me come back to that question in a second because I think that's a great depression question. So Germany has this terrible situation, this cycle of, of in hyperinflation they can't get out of. And what happens is, first of all, the United States puts money into Germany. We put about a billion dollars into Germany by the end of the 1920s to try to, to, try to make sure that they can actually pay their war debts. Uh, but the other thing that Germany does, which is very interesting, is they change currencies in 1925. And they go from the Reichsmark to the Rentenmark, and they peg the Reichsmark as, uh, uh, I think it's a, a million Reichsmarks to one Rentenmark, the new currency. Therefore, you, if you have debt in Reichsmarks, you can pay it off very easily. Now, those who had savings in Reichsmarks, they were, they were in very bad shape. But overnight, the German economy recovers from this little trick of creating a new currency. The currency, by the way, was based upon real estate. Uh, commercial and private real estate in the country, not based upon gold or anything else, because Germany simply didn't have enough gold at this time uh, to uh, to actually uh, you know provide a solid basis for the currency. So, so that's Germany in the 1920s. Now there is some social unrest, but surprisingly, the the most of the unrest doesn't happen until the late 1920s when Germany slides into the Great Depression. And then, of course, you have the rise of Nazism in the early 1930s, but also in the in the United States, when the United States slides into the Great Depression in the night in the early 1930s. You know, the stock market crash in 1929, and then depression in 1930, and up until uh, almost World War II. Uh, uh, and then, so in the United States, you have uh, you have uh, I mean, you have tremendous uh, problems. You have starvation, quite frankly, in the summer. Uh, pardon me, the winter of 1932, 1933. Uh, and uh, you have businesses that are simply not, I mean, they're not, you know, to the question of the viewer, they're not paying in contributions. They're not, they're, the factories are not open in Detroit, for instance. Detroit had 70% unemployment and people starving in the streets in 1932, 1933. And so the union benefits will last a while, but they won't last very long. And by the mid 1930s, you had pitched battles in Detroit between uh, the, the hired thugs of, for instance, Ford Motor Company and uh, union workers uh, who, were, who simply wanted to get back and, and start working their jobs again. So, and a lot of times what happened then is they would hire strike breakers. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's impossible to know right now exactly what's going to happen in Hawaii at a local level. But at a national level, we'll probably see higher levels of social banditry and could be uh, higher levels of, of you know, violence, uh, domestic violence and, you know, violence in workplaces. I, I just don't know. But this is, one of, this is one of the things that happens when the economies become destabilized as societies, you know, the social fabric begins to be torn. So. Yeah. Well, I think people are uh, feeling a little of that already. There was an article in the paper about a fellow in Kalihi over the weekend who was doing target target practice out of his window in his condo oh. apartment, and uh, the neighbor the neighbors complained about that, and the police came and took him away. But so. but uh, imagine, you know, he 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 was liberated uh, from the norms that would normally apply, <laughs> and I think uh, that's that's a you know, it's an indicator of some kind yeah. that people no, are right. losing I mean, it a little bit. You know, yeah. When when people have to begin to choose uh, to not eat enough food to put food in their kids' stomachs before they can have food, 
and I, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we might be close uh, six months, three, four, five months from now, we could be close to that. Then, th then it becomes a serious social crisis in addition to an economic crisis. Uh, and so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very serious. Well, based on, based yeah. on the history of it, coming right. out of it, do we just wait this thing through, John, or is there affirmative action the government can take? I mean, I know that FDR was not perfect, but he certainly, he took, in the New Deal, he took a lot of action, right. and for the most part, it helped, didn't it? So shouldn't we look yeah. at that now? Yeah, well, I think so. I think uh, I think the New Deal is is the model. I mean, we're using some of that model already and offering temporary relief to uh, to people who don't have jobs and and offering businesses some relief and and uh, you know we'll see how far the government goes but you can do other things you can uh, you know uh, you can drive down uh, supply to induce more demand uh, that was done in the in the new deal with some success in the agricultural sector so so there are things that you can do um, the, the, the thing is, we don't know exactly where this is going to go. One of my concerns is not that we're going to have hyperinflation like Germany. Okay, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, when you look at the price of, of uh, treasury bonds right now, they are inc they're incredibly low, even compared to a year ago. I mean, they're just rock bottom. It's because uh, there's so, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> there, there's so much instability in the world and <coughs> And the United States, even though it's falling into a recession, maybe a depression, looks relatively stable. And so uh, people from other countries are socking their money into American bonds. Uh, so, so it's not hyperinflation just because of the shape of the world economy. I don't think we're going to go there, at least not yet, even though the, the Federal Reserve is actually creating a lot of money right now. I think it could be more like Japan. Japan from about 1990 to the present has suffered from very low or no economic growth. Uh, and, and they've been caught in what we call a liquidity trap in which people are, you know, your, your average person is, is hesitant to consume, is hesitant to make investments, and therefore takes money, takes money out of the stock market, takes money out of the bank, or, or leaves it in the bank. But but it holds it in cash. Now, Japan has had uh, one of the best saving countries in, in the world in the post-war period. They have a huge amount of personal saving. The problem with the Japanese has always been to get them to spend. Uh, and it's, it's slightly better now, but the truth is the Japanese economy is still in a situation where people are, are, are concerned, so they're holding back cash and that creates a lack of investment and you know opportunities for businesses to create uh, new products and and then the, the government is the fallback in this case and the japanese government has done what the united states government is beginning to do now which is take uh, a lot of money and invest it over time and so the japanese have had excess budget since the 90s and their uh, their spending their national debt is now at about 220% of their uh, of their GDP, and so it's even it's twice as much as the United States. Now the United States, of course, has a lot bigger budget than Japan, but so my concern is that we could end up flatlining and get ourselves into a liquidity trap. And I'll be honest with you, I've already kind of contributed that because I'm no longer in the stock market. When all of this happened, I I began to pull out of the stock market, and and if enough people do that. Uh, then what you'll have is a kind of situation where it will be very difficult to generate inflation and you're going to have to keep interest rates very low, which means that people will, there will be very little incentive for people to take their money out of cash and invest it in anything because interest rates are so low. Mm. So that's my concern is we could end up like Japan. Well, let me, let me ask you this, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, um, this is about, Mm, about the public. It's about how people feel and think and how they conduct themselves financially. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, yes, they could wish to go back to normal or as uh, Trump says, normality. I don't think that's a real word. Uh, 
but um, or, or they could do something else. And yeah. I, I guess the big question, it's a hard one. I don't know if you have a, a ready answer, but yeah. what do people, what do people, what should they think now? How should they see all of this? How right. should they see the future, knowing the risk of recession, depression coming right. soon? You know, I suppose if everybody got back out there on the street, mask or no mask, um, and and live their lives the lives to the fullest extent as they could, that would be good for us. But yeah, it's, it right. may not be good for them individually. Right. So this is you know after after nine eleven, then George W. Bush went on TV and said, everybody needs to spend, they need to consume so we can get the economy going again. And that actually kind of worked. But in this situation, the problem is, even if you have money, people are afraid to go out and spend because they can't go out or they can go out only if they have masks on. So it's a little different. So it's not like a typical recession in that way because, uh, because people are constrained from actually going out and spending money in ways that they might even in another kind of recession simply because of COVID. So th this is a complicating factor. Um, it could mean that once people can go out and spend that they will have enough money uh, and they'll start to spend and the economy will, will kick back in gear pretty quickly. That's possible. But the problem with that scenario is the unemployment, quite frankly. The, un the unemployment in this, you know, in this situation is something we should have avoided this at all costs because we saw what happened in the 2008 Great Recession. When, with 10% unemployment, it took us, you know, it took us until 2016 to fully recover from that. Yeah. We so really if there was a, if there was another president, I mean, I I think we agree that this president isn't isn't likely to be able to fix things. Uh, it yeah. just makes the wrong moves all the time. He has the wrong advisors, yeah. and he, he doesn't even listen to things. them. Yeah. Um, but if there was another president, uh, Biden, say for example, um, would that change the the scenario that you describe? Could it change the scenario you describe? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of it is confidence, right? Do people feel confident? And and uh, you know. And, and do, you know, do leader, do, do they feel confident in their leaders that they'll do the right thing, that they'll protect them? And so, uh, you know, part of it is, Jay, do, do people feel confident in this? So. Yeah, well, you know, in, in, in case you thought this election coming in November was important for you know, the rule of law, for corruption, for bringing the branches of government back to proper operation, it's far more important than even that. Uh, it, yeah. it will really determine the future of the country, the world, yeah. and, our, and our individual lives. No, that's John, true. thank you so much for helping us understand this. We have sure. to keep on doing it uh, yeah. because, you know, why change is the only thing that is for sure. Yeah. And uh, I hope to catch you again next, next couple of weeks yeah. and we'll, we'll continue this important conversation. Okay, uh, Jay. Good to John be David and history professor. And what did, what did George Santayana said? Uh, <laughs> if, if you ignore <laughs> history, you're going to repeat it. That's what he said. Right. right. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. He was wrong about that. <laughs>